just for his support over uh, the last few days. Uh, I've did a pretty good job, I think, on trying to wreck his head uh, and didn't succeed, but I appreciate uh, all the help he's given me and everybody else in Leinster uh, Council uh, as well. Um, I had <clears throat> the title of the presentation, Creating a Coherent Player Pathway, and towards the end of the presentation, we, we will get to how you can make uh, a difference in your coaching expertise. But for the, for the earlier part uh, of the presentation, I'm just going to give you a background to the consultation that Colin spoke about um, uh, a few minutes ago. Um, I was asked to chair a committee on, uh, on behalf of the GA by John Horn, and it was called the Talent Academy and Player Development Review Committee. A uh, nice big uh, title. Um, uh, and the people who were on that uh, committee along with me, um, just trying to get to the slide here, um, Talent Academy and Player Development Work Group, um, we had people from, from all of the four uh, provinces. Um, uh, all of the people involved are, were active coaches at the time. We started our work um, two years ago. Uh, I thought when I took on the job at chair that it might just take a few months uh, to get it completed, but uh, it, it, it took a lot longer. Uh, I would have to say at the outset here, just acknowledge uh, the great work uh, put into a report by Brian Cuthbert, uh, who has completed a PhD, a PhD in the area of talent development, and uh, Jenny Duffy, who was our secretary and who kept us all on track and did tro Trojan work. Now, all members of the committee uh, made a serious input and had to travel all over the country to visit uh, counties. Uh, and I suppose one of the very pleasing aspects from, from my own point of view about, about the committee was I learned so much from all of the other people uh, who were on it. Uh, it was like a community of practice among ourselves. Obviously, we had a job to do but we learned so much from each other and uh, I met uh, great friends. Um, as I said, the earlier part of the presentation is going to be about that consultation uh, and just be patient with me, but hopefully it sets the scene uh, for what will come later in the presentation and how you as a coach uh, can make a positive difference to the lives of your players, uh, to their sport and development and to performance uh, also. Um, our terms of reference, uh, what we were asked to, to review, uh, we were asked to conduct a review of the current player pathway at inter-county level uh, from under 13 uh, to under 20. Uh, in doing so, to review the relationship that exists between academies and its supporting uh, pillars to clubs, schools and third level institutions. Uh, while the reason for setting up the committee in the first place, which I forgot to mention, was that John Horne had received feedback from certain quarters uh, about the role of our academies in our player pathway, that they had become elitist, uh, that players, when they went back to their clubs, had inflated egos, and that players uh, who had been deselected de from academy squads uh, possibly uh, gave up uh, playing GA uh, altogether. So that was the rationale as to why the committee was set up. Uh, it was impossible for us to look at the role of uh, the academy squads in the player pathway without also looking at the role of the club and the school and third level uh, institutions and the relationship that exists between all of those. Because essentially, while we have players in our academy squad system, they are also club players uh, they are also school players, and at some level when they're playing underage uh, county, they're also in our third level institutions. So all of these uh, people are dealing with the same game and the same player, so we had to look at that relationship between all of them. Uh, what we also needed to do was to establish the purpose and vision for inter-county player development programmes, uh, because when we went looking at what was available, there was no real vision or mission for what was happening uh, in the space of our academy squads, which was very surprising. So what was the vision 
and what was the purpose of our academy squads in the first place. Uh, we, were, we also examined uh, key elements surrounding player development, uh, governance at national level, uh, provincial level, county level, looked at uh, coaching inputs and uh, games programs. So uh, our consultation, that was our terms of reference. Uh, we looked at what was going well. We looked at what, and, uh, what the issues were, and we can come up with a set of recommendations. Um, the big questions, uh, what actually uh, is the purpose of our squads? Uh, do, our, do our stakeholders understand the purpose of our squads? Are our squads adding value to, to player development? We felt those were the big questions which we had to find answers to. Uh, this is where it gets very interesting. Uh, initially, I thought the consultation would just take a few months, uh, but we decided in our wisdom for our consultation to uh, be meaningful, uh, that rather than go on a provincial level and get feedback, we needed to visit every county uh, in Ireland. Uh, we felt it was necessary to do so, because the county uh, in which I am in here now at the moment, Carlo, is completely different to Dublin. Uh, and every county has its own culture, traditions, and has its own context. Uh, over 1,000 stakeholders were surveyed, over 7,000 statements were gathered, and statements were divided into key issues, uh, key recommendations, uh, and commended uh, practices. Um, we also uh, consulted uh, other committees uh, and other people who have input, inputs into uh, inputs into our player pathway and player development, uh, and they're all listed uh, there, including uh, the Ladies Football Association and the Camogie Association. Uh, and what I've also just forgot to mention is that uh, when we did go out to all of the counties, um, the people who actually came to the meetings uh, were full-time staff, um, were parents of players, were players themselves from club and academy squad level, county board officers, uh, coaches at club level, uh, coaches of the academy squads, and uh, post-primary teachers. So those are the stakeholders, all of the stakeholders who were involved with underage players uh, within, within uh, their counties. Surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, it was the first time all of those stakeholders had gathered together within their county to discuss the player they were all dealing with and the game they were all dealing with. Uh, and that was very surprising. If we are talking about having a player-centred approach, if we are talking about the player being at the centre of it and our game being at the centre of it, in terms of well, welfare and in terms of coaching inputs, uh, how come these people had never come together uh, to talk uh, about how do we improve the lot of our game and our, our players? So that was very surprising. Uh, incidentally, also, a lot of the counties would have come back to us afterwards and said that they would have found having that particular meeting was a, was a great benefit in terms of the learning uh, everybody gained uh, at those consultations. Uh, the key issues, um, and I suppose before I get into the key issues, I would just like to mention, I, I, I suppose at a personal level, uh, and this would have been articulated by all members of our committee also, was the amount of volunteerism, the amount of passion the amount of interest we found among all of those people, the amounts of good coaching we found uh, we found that was that was going on, uh, lots of really good practice. But we were just bowled over, and I know sometimes we talk about we talk about volunteerism and our coaches uh, within the GA and what to do, but you have to visit every county to meet the passionate uh, people who are doing incredible voluntary work looking after the young people in our association. Uh, so there was lots of good things happening. 
uh, but there was also lots of issues which we came across. Some of these probably will be of no surprise to you. Uh, I don't know what the background of the people who are listening in is, but as coaches, I'm sure uh, you understand that the world of coaching is very complex and you have to deal with lots of issues in terms of games programs, club officials, county board officials, uh, referees, parents. So the world of coaching uh, is complex. Uh, and that's what I would have found out from my experience as part of this committee. I knew the GA was complex, but I now realize uh, it's extremely complex. And if you let it, it, it could wreck your head. Um, in terms of governance, what we found, and this is going, this is looking at uh, nobody in particular, we're looking at national, provincial, uh, and county level, inadequate governance within the area of player development, managers and, and coaches control player activities with little or no consultation between e each other, and I suppose what we would have found in the consultation, for the first time ever, we had post-primary uh, teachers in, we had academy squad coaches and club coaches, but it was the first time they had ever actually met each other. So everybody operating within their own silo uh, and not communicate with the other coaches of the same uh, of the same player. Centrally, I suppose, from a governance point of view, what we found out is that the GA are mere, are mere bystanders and have limited control in what happens at ground level. So within the area of academy squads, uh, most counties did what they wanted. Uh, some had very intensive um, programs, others less so, but basically uh, every county had a different approach, different number of training sessions, different number of inputs, uh, and the GA were mere bystanders, uh, bystanders in terms of what was actually happening, in terms of control and monitoring of what was happening. Lack of clarity and coherency between and amongst uh, stakeholders, nobody leading the developmental process and willing to look at the, uh, the bigger picture. Um, most people concerned about winning, not about developing the players, not about seeing the bigger picture or seeing the end uh, in, in mind. And nobody leading that at, uh, at county, provincial or national level. Stakeholders, Everywhere we went, every county said, uh, promise when you do, uh, when you make your recommendations, promise there will be change. But most stakeholders, would, uh, while desiring change, were not sure where change would come from or who would uh, promote it. Uh, second issue, uh, player development pathway, lack of understanding of the principles of the current underpinning framework and poor coherency in communication through a support and coach development uh, framework. So I suppose there, when we talk about lack of understanding of the principles of the current underpinning uh, framework, uh, I suppose when we ask the question, do you, uh, what is the player pathway within the GA? Most people couldn't answer that question. Now we do know it's child, youth and adult, uh, but it's very much a staged approach where you do certain things with your players depending, uh, on, uh, depending upon their age. We now know that players obviously uh, develop at different rates uh, and that you can't apply a coaching philosophy or a coaching system where you will, which is based on the age of, of the players. Every player needs to be assessed on his individual, on his or her individual uh, needs. Uh, focuses on team preparation rather than individual development. Again, um, in most cases, um, it's about uh, winning competitions rather than seeing the end in mind uh, and what the role of uh, working with academy squads is, is, is about. So it was about team preparation rather than the individual development of the players within that team. This is multiplied across the three strands of club, school and county and results in players simply playing the next game with limited thought to personal development and improving. In lots of cases, uh, we were dealing with dual players, players playing for club, school and county and it was more a matter of turning up to play games, uh, win the next game 
and being under pressure from somebody to go and play a game with little thought for that player's individual development or for having a good ratio of coaching to the number of games uh, played. Next issue uh, was poor understanding of uh, poor understanding and evaluation of player development practices within counties. Individual units are operating as silos within the developmental process. Nobody will be willing to bend and consider the indiv individual person as a priority. I suppose when we talk about the poor understanding <coughs> and evaluation of player development, uh, very little evaluation or monitoring from national level. Uh, very little uh, evaluation or monitoring happen, happen at provincial level. And in some cases, very little evaluation or monitoring uh, at county level. People were put into positions in, in, in their own space. Uh, other issues in the area of coach education, and I presume some of you will be, um, will be pretty familiar with this, uh, particularly with academy squads. Uh, some counties more so than others, uh, huge issues with recruiting uh, coaches uh, and education, educating uh, co coaches, particularly the first one in terms of recruitment. Uh, many counties just find it very difficult to get in uh, quality coaches with a developmental uh, mindset uh, and expertise, uh, and we're willing to put in place more or less anybody, and then they were left up to their own devices without being supported throughout the year uh, in terms of workshops, uh, coach education, mentoring, uh, etc. Obviously, uh, there were issues with deselection, uh, how it was handled uh, in many of the counties, and then there were issues with alignment within the developmental process, uh, coaches not communicating to each other, even although they're dealing with, uh, dealing with the same player. Uh, confusion regarding development and elitists and academies are not elitists, but stakeholders expose elitist messages. And I suppose in, in this particular instance, we're getting to one of the big questions we had. Uh, lots of confusion about the role of the squads and whether it's about development or whether it's about uh, elitism. Uh, in many cases, uh, we did not, uh, in the majority of cases, we did not find uh, major examples of high performance or intensive training, which is what you would, or, or large backroom teams involved with academy squad, which is what you would expect with elite teams. Uh, but what we did find is that uh, academies are not elitists, but stakeholders expose elitist messages so that if somebody was with an under 14 academy squad they thought they were in charge of the under 14 county team and that's the message they were relaying to the players you have now become a county uh, player the coach seen himself as a county coach and the message being given to players was you have now become a county player Demand for coaches uh, was another issue for a more nuanced coach education approach uh, applicable uh, in their uh, context. Um, and what they were actually talking about here was more coaching support in terms of uh, workshops, uh, more uh, mentoring the coach or coaching uh, uh, the coach. Uh, those are the main issues we found, uh, and I suppose this particular player in one county uh, would be uh, gives a good indication of the issues I've just mentioned. He was playing uh, with six uh, different teams. Uh, there was no communication between the coaches in terms of the player's training load, in terms of the number of matches he was playing or in terms of coaching inputs, shared coaching inputs, in terms of the long-term development of the player. Everybody just wanted this particular uh, player for the next match. Uh, when we asked uh, this group of players in this particular county, uh, this particular player said, my coach 
only values me when I can play for his team. So outside of playing for his team, uh, in terms of his academic uh, life, in terms of his social life, in terms of his commitment to all of the other team, the coach had no interest. Is there any value? I suppose uh, the, the big questions we were asked to look at, so is there any value uh, in, in, in the squads? Uh, our recommendation is to have framed within the right environment and structure, squads will bring the following benefits. Provide players with appropriate levels of challenge whereby competition would be used as a developmental tool that is coping with pressure, higher intensity games, uh, playing against better players. Um, squads would have the end in mind as the focus whereby potential would be maximized through exposure to an environment that is challenging but supportive, developmental yet inspirational. So we do believe uh, if the message around your squads is the correct message, and I will come to that later, that there is a role uh, for squads within the GA. Uh, just moving on to uh, the same question. Through proper alignment, squad involvement will strengthen players' understanding of the centrality of their, uh, of their role, their club players in their development. By developing such an understanding, the association can promote talent development at club level, whereby academy activity can be viewed as an adjunct to club, pro to club programs rather than the other way around. Uh, and I will be coming to this again later, but we believe the message players uh, should be getting within the academy squads from their coaches and from all of the other stakeholders is to make better to make players better for their clubs. Um, central to this also is that we keep the base as wide as possible for as long as possible so that the majority of club players, uh, whether it's done on a regional basis or however the competitions and coaching is structured, more players get an opportunity to be part uh, of, of the squad experience. To create value uh, and to solve the issues which I, I have which I have just gone through and which we uh, got from our consultation, uh, we, we believe, and this is where we have made some recommendations, uh, the following must happen. A new player pathway framework, um, a matching approach to stakeholder education. So if we have a new player pathway framework, uh, we have a coach education, coach education approach which is built on top of that framework implement a new governance structure around development activities this obviously has implications for uh, what happens at national provincial and county level and we need to realign competition structures so that the support rather than hinder uh, development Despite kind of all of what we found out in the consultation uh, uh, and the experience of that chat that I mentioned that was playing uh, with multiple teams, and despite all the research in the area uh, of talent uh, development, uh, will the experience of these kids uh, be different? Uh, I think that's the challenge we all face. Uh, it's a huge challenge for the GA. Uh, and I suppose just for, on, on a personal level, uh, my own belief around that is uh, there is nothing especially hard about what we should be doing. Uh, much harder, I believe, is that is accepting that our conventional wisdom needs to change. That we realize we need to change if we are going to keep more players in the club, maximize their potential. Uh, bring more players through to county level, give more players an enjoyable uh, experience. Uh, so I think we need to recognize as a sporting body that all of us working together 
need to change uh, to do our jobs better in the interests of our players and in the interests uh, of, of our games. Uh, this might sound a little bit wordy, um, but what we are proposing in terms of, or what we believe needs to be done in terms of a player pathway framework is a practical framework would be useful as a tool that the GA can use to plan what to offer, uh, when to offer it, and how to deliver programs that complement one another. So pathway frameworks are used by uh, all sporting associations to clarify what a player's journey and so that all stakeholders understand them and coherency can be built on top of that. Uh, what we are proposing uh, is the FTEM uh, framework, which has been developed by Jason Gulben at the Australian Institute of Sport. Um, it's based on international uh, best practice. Uh, and I'm just moving on to it uh, quickly here. Um, we've researched many other uh, frameworks or models, uh, but we felt this best reflects uh, what is needed in a GA context. And indeed, we have changed uh, we have changed the framework uh, to suit the context of the GA because the last letter in the FTEM. Uh, framework um, is mastery uh, and that applies more to other sports which have an international uh, an international dimension. So uh, we believe uh, by having this framework uh, that it is uh, it will help to give clarity to all stakeholders um, understanding of the necessary requirements at the various stages of a player's development and will thus help them to achieve their, uh, to achieve their potential. Um, what we strongly believe in as a committee and based on our consultation also uh, is that we want to reposition the club as the central component of the player development uh, pathway. Uh, this can only be done by uh, can only be achieved by realigning the current player pathway model to a, a clear and concise framework, which is inclusive of participation, uh, talent development, and elite performance. Uh, now, if you look at the picture which is in front of you, you will see that the large uh, blue area represents the club. Uh, and that the talent uh, academies, post-primary schools, are out here to the right. And our inter-county game is a much smaller uh, area at, at the very top. Here to the left, uh, we have F1 and F2, uh, which is fundamental, which is uh, nursery, uh, then moving on to Go Games and then moving into underage uh, competitions and adult uh, with, the, with, with the club. Uh, apart to the right hand side here uh, is concerned um, with identification um, of talent, uh, very verification of talent, uh, then breakthrough, which may happen at third level, uh, are at under 19 level uh, and breaking on to uh, senior inter county teams. It consists of eight, eight stages. Each stage advocates the best practice um, uh, approach uh, by giving players the right support at the right time and to the right group of players uh, based, on, uh, based on their needs. It allows for multiple entry and exit points along the pathway as development of players is non-linear. We are not suggesting here that players will move in a, in a linear fashion uh, all of the way up. That's not how player development uh, works. Uh, we understand that everybody develops at different rates and it's non-linear and players may opt in or out 
of the pathway uh, depending on their own circumstances uh, or their own uh, motivation at different stages. Um, our framework uh, is just a framework and as I said it will allow administrators and coaches to apply an informed uh, contemporary best practice approach at each stage of development within their own context. Um, it allows parents and other stakeholders an understanding of the necessary requirements that are needed uh, at, at the different uh, stages in helping players to develop their full potential and which in turn will sustain a lifelong participation uh, in Gaelic games. Uh, this understanding was lacking during our consultation uh, period. Uh, in essence also, the framework will support development, uh, providing right support at the right time. For example, um, an under-16 player uh, will require different support structures than a, an elite uh, in, in, inter-county player. Uh, but it's just a framework to provide clarity. But in order to make this framework work, uh, it needs to be accompanied by key features or underlying, uh, or underlying principles. Uh, the key principles are having long, -terms, uh, long term aims and methods, uh, similar messages uh, coming from national level, provincial level, and county level, uh, emphasizing appropriate uh, development rather than an overemphasis uh, on winning at a very young age, uh, recognizing the player as the center of our pathway and providing individualized and ongoing uh, development and integrating all of our efforts uh, together in a holistic and systematic uh, manner uh, for, for, for the benefit of our players. I suppose if I was trying to, this is taken uh, from some research, sorry if it's a little bit uh, wordy, if I was trying to explain this uh, probably in my own words, uh, I would say it's trying to get balance into our player uh, development pathway. Uh, and I would say what it means is that players' needs come, for, come first, uh, working together for a collective impact, which means that all stakeholders, including parents, put their own interests aside, align policies and practices, and collaborate in the best interests of the player and, and the game. It means we have an effective pathway which is underpinned uh, by evidence, which is uh, which does underpin the framework we are uh, recommending. And I identify the opportunities and the expectations of uh, individual players uh, at every level. Uh, it's also underpinned by continuous learning uh, continuous learning and a growth mindset underpin, underpins success for the player and for all of the people who support the player and for the organization that enables us all, which is the, which is the GAA. Uh, I would also, uh, the last point about the key principles is the area of quality coaching and, and, and the role of the coach. Uh, quality coaching is critical to the long-term uh, uh, development of the player and his success. Quality coaches understand the performance needs of the player and influence the people and the environment that surrounds uh, the player. Uh, just to recap on uh, this part uh, of, uh, of the presentation, uh, the good news is uh, and I, I'm sure you may have some questions around this. Uh, all of our recommendations have at this stage been approved by the National Coaching and Games Committee, uh, have been uh, approved by Central Council, and have been approved by the Management uh, Committee uh, of, of the GA. Uh, it hasn't reached uh, provincial level or county level yet, 
but that is in the often and should happen in, in, in the near future. I personally believe uh, that's just some of the recommendations uh, which we have come up with. Uh, our book that I think uh, extends to about 90 uh, pages. Uh, so there are lots of different recommendations in the different areas. I believe it has the ability to transform how we do our business in the GA in terms of developing the potential of our players, keeping more players uh, in the game, having a more holistic approach to the development of our players, uh, will enable coaches, uh, will provide more support uh, for coaches uh, in, in the work that they are uh, doing. And I think it will provide a lot of clarity for all of the other stakeholders who are involved in the developmental uh, process or the coaching environment. That's parents, uh, county board officials, uh, people at national level, and provincial uh, level. Uh, I accept it's complex and it's going to be a big challenge, uh, but with strong leadership, uh, good systems, good people put in place and a growth mindset. Uh, it's our belief, it's the committee's belief that our recommendations can have a huge impact uh, on the, the future development uh, of our games. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions at this stage. Uh, I accept it may be a little bit abstract or may have a little bit more to do with governance, but I would appreciate where I would appreciate any questions around how you see your needs being met in the way we see uh, the way forward. Michael, we have a question there from Owen. Yeah, from, from Owen, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, hi, Owen. Um, excellent question. I'm just reading it here again. Uh, have you assessed the effect of increasing numbers on development squads uh, on club training? Yeah, um, obviously, Owen, that's a very good question. Um, we would see the club, uh, as, to, uh, as I said, as part of our framework, we would see the club as the central uh, part of that framework and of, of the uh, player pathway. Uh, where we see how this is actually going to work uh, it, it is that insofar as possible, there would be blocks of uh, periods for club training, for uh, school training and for academy uh, squad, uh, for academy squad training. Um, how we actually see this working from a governance point of view is the counties will develop uh, their own plans in the area of coaching and games uh, for a three-year period. Uh, that will be assisted by people at provincial level, a player pathway manager, a player pathway manager at county level, at provincial level, uh, and at national level. Uh, the role of the club needs to be to be protected. Uh, so the role of the academy squad should not take precedence over what needs to happen uh, at, at, at club level. So the whole area of fixtures, as we would have uh, uh, found them, uh, was causing consternation among all stakeholders. And, and one of the things we found is that there was an overlap between club activity and post-primary activity. Uh, and in some counties, there was some overlap between academy squad uh, activity and club activity. But we believe if um, our vision of placing the club at the center of it is all planning and schedule and fixtures need to prioritize the role of the club uh, going forward. Just another question here, Michael from Paddy Gavin. Um, yeah. Who in the club should act as liaison person between club selectors, school, and development squads? Uh, okay. Who in the club should act as liaison person? Um, okay. Uh, 
I, I suppose to coach an officer, um, Paddy is the person who should be acting as a uh, liaison. Uh, but that's if you want to appoint one person who's going to be looking after it. Uh, I, I, I think maybe one of the issues for a lot of clubs is probably getting the person uh, in as coach and officer who understands the demands being placed on young people. Uh, but where we would also see somebody having a role in this regard would be at county level, so that there would be a player pathway manager at county level uh, who is able to sort out any issues that occur between clubs, uh, schools and academy squad players in terms of uh, players not being available, in terms of crazy uh, workloads, uh, players being subjected to too much training, players having to play too many matches, that there would be somebody at county level who can step in uh, and make the required decisions in the interests uh, of the player. Um, very good, Michael. The next one is from Eamon Redmond here. Um, he, he feels that there appears to be a gap or a gap develops in the skills, fitness and physique between development squad players and club players. How can this gap be minimised? Yeah, I, I suppose uh, a gap in skills, uh, fitness and physique. Um, yeah, I, I'm not so sure, uh, Eamon, about the physique uh, part of it because in our experience... Um, uh, there wasn't a huge amount of strength work uh, going on in a lot of academies. Now, maybe your experience uh, is different, but but uh, as part of our framework, uh, Eamon, we see whatever is happening at an academy squad level should be transferred and should be done at club level because the club is now the centre of our player pathway. So instead of... Uh, best practice just happening in the academies it should be happening in the clubs uh, and the academy squads are just an adjunct uh, of what's actually happening uh, at, at club level so uh, if good things are happening with academy squads there needs to be greater coherency between uh, clubs uh, from a county planning point of view from a coaching point of view there needs to be greater coherency between club and academy squads to ensure whatever development uh, academy squad players are getting is also available at, at club level. And I know in some counties that had very interesting uh, ways of, uh, of dealing with that in, insofar as that if academy squads were having workshops or were having a particular coaching session, maybe a goalkeeping coaching session, if they were doing some uh, body weight resistance training exercises, uh, they would actually notify the coaches of the players at club level who were in with the academies and they would invite them into academy squad sessions so that they could bring back that education uh, to, to their club. I think to be fair, Michael, you've probably answered Conor Mulhall's question at the bottom there. Should club coaches be invited in to see the level of coaching uh, right. development squad? So, yeah, again, no, I think that's answered. That's, that's yeah, I, uh, Conor, I think if we're talking about uh, coherency, if, uh, I, I suppose one of the things I can't just understand, because to me it's just, uh, it's so simple. If we are all dealing with the same player, he's a club player, he's a teacher, uh, he's a post-primary uh, player, uh, and he's an academy squad player, if we genuinely have the interests of that player at heart, why are we not communicating our efforts, not just in terms of the player's welfare, not just in terms of making sure uh, his, uh, of his train loads, um, but in terms of the, develop the, the developmental process that that player needs to undertake to achieve his potential so what i'm saying there for example is if somebody is in with the academy squads should the coaches of the academy squads um should the coaches of the academy squads not be contacting the club coaches to say that uh, jack 
needs to improve kicking with his left or striking off his left. We've given him some homework to do, but we want you to re-emphasize the message uh, when he gets back to the club. It's going to increase the player's motivation. It, he's going to know we're all on the same track and have his interest at heart. And we're also making him a better player for his club. Should the same not be happening at post-primary level, uh, should the academy squad coaches not be talking to the post-primary teachers about we've given this player some homework to do, uh, it could be uh, psychological, uh, developing his attitude, it could be fitness related, it could be tactical decision making, or it could be technical. But why don't we share our coaching inputs to further develop the particular uh, player? So why are we all working in silos where in some cases you may be getting some good coaching, in other cases it's all about winning, but we are not genuinely centred on the player's needs and working in a coherent manner together uh, to help that player achieve their potential. And we have to ask the question, what is the end in mind for this player? Do we want this player to be the best he can be at 21, 22, 23, still playing with his club or playing with his county and still enjoying the game? So is that the end result we are looking for? And if it is, should we not be should we not have more giant up thinking in terms of that player's development? Or are we all just obsessed about our own team? and winning with our own team, but not seeing the end in mind for that particular player. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Just the next question there, we skipped over, it was just Gary. Gary's question. He just said a fixtures program and he, he feels in his own county um, isn't great, and he feels that it's it's the club fixtures are structured around the academy program rather than the other way around. And he's wondering, in all your consultations, did you come across any county that where it was good practice or examples of where it was working well? Okay, Colin, can you just repeat that? This is from Patrick Kenny, is it? No, sorry, from Gary Boyle. It's just a little bit higher. He says, oh, yeah, club, sorry, yeah. The, the club is key in this framework, and he knows his own county, the games program for underage clubs is poor. And should the academy squads fit around the club activity rather than club fixtures working around the academy squads training and matches? So I think in that he's sort of saying that there's a bias that the, the academy squad takes precedent over the club fixtures, etc. And from your experience going around the counties, is there ones where any county where you would have seen it working really well as an example? Yeah, well, I, uh, I, I would think, uh, Gary, uh, that the academy squads should be working around club activity and, and that probably goes back to maybe a lack of, of planning and hopefully that will be uh, that will change as part of our uh, recommendations. Uh, if we forget about if the clubs are going to suffer as a result of academy squad activity, uh, then we end up with uh, not producing players uh, for academy squads in the future because the uh, players start with their clubs uh, for a lucky few, approximately maybe 1%. Uh, go on to play with their county, but the vast majority of players stay with their club, and even if they do go on to play with their county, they will end up and come back and play with their club again. So we need to, the academy squad activity needs to be built around club activity. Now, obviously, Gary, just to, um, I, I, I can't remember every county, but uh, if you look at the games program in Dublin, um up to under 16 level, I, I think for 40 odd weeks of the year, um, every uh, young player gets a game every weekend. So it's football one weekend and it's hurling the following, the, the following weekend. So that for approximately 10 months of the year, they are getting a match with their club every weekend. So then uh, you have a pretty good ratio of uh, of coaching to matches uh, so that you can have your two coaching sessions uh, during the week uh, to help the development of your players. And then competition is used uh, as a developmental uh, uh, approach for further developing the players. 
because obviously we need competition. It's not all about winning, uh, but we do need competition. If we don't have competition, uh, we don't have a game, and young people naturally want to be uh, competitive. But that would probably be one of the best examples of a very good uh, club programme. And I know you might be saying to yourself, well, it's easy to do it in Dublin uh, because of their population. But I, I, I think, Gary, possibly we need to maybe look at uh, cross-county activity as well. Uh, uh, you possibly could have a weaker code in one county with a small number of furling clubs, uh, and it's difficult to have a proper games programme. So we do need to look at different ways of giving players uh, access to a better uh, games programme, and that might require thinking outside the box a little bit. We'll, we'll take the last question here from Patrick Kenny, Michael, from this stage, because I know you have a few more things to go through. So yeah. his question <clears throat> is, how can we set up underage competitions for learning rather than just winning? Is competition introduced too early? Um, right, okay, it's an interesting question, uh, Patrick. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think it would be our recommendation that we need to uh, de-emphasize winning uh, at... Uh, at earlier stages, uh, or at the earlier uh, ages, um, I, I, I think some of if if you take the Tony Forrestal or whatever, I mean, it's very much uh, about winning the competition, and there's a lot of pressure uh, on kids uh, to to compete. Um, but uh, how do we set up uh, competitions uh, for learning? Um, I, I, I think it really comes down uh, to, to coaching inputs. It, it, it really comes down uh, to, to kind of um, the coaching philosophy and coaching uh, behaviours. I mean, I, I think that's one of the issues. And I know just from being at National Coaching and Games recently that even at, um, uh, even at very early ages now in, in terms of our Go Games, uh, there's a lot of emphasis uh, on winning um, and a lot of behaviour on the sideline from, say, coaches, from parents, uh, and there's a lot of pressure on people uh, to win matches. And, and, and my own view is that we can only change this through uh, education and having proper systems and monitoring uh in place as to what's going, as to what's happening within, within counties. Uh, specifically, how can we set up underage uh, competitions that promote learning? Um, I think it's difficult. Uh, if you have them uh, on a league system, um, but once you have a final, I, I, I think there's always going to be some element uh, of uh, there's going to be a pressure and there's going to be pressure from coaches. So uh, I, I think it really goes back. Uh, I know I've gone around this a little bit uh, in ways. I think it goes back to educating the coaches, educating the stakeholders, and uh, educating uh, the parents as well, uh, Patrick. Perfect, Michael. I think that's the questions for now. If you want to continue, yeah, on. probably uh, tailors in well for your next bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, probably the competitions. Uh, uh, Colin, are you still on there? There. Yeah, still here. Yeah, no. I just think Patrick's uh, question there is very good, and I'm not particularly strong, uh, maybe on the competition side of it, uh, but I think maybe we should try to come back to him from a Leinster perspective, uh, or that we will come back to him there maybe because. I know there are other recommendations in the report just around uh, underage competition. So uh, if we want to follow up with them, yeah. we'd, be we'd, be, we'd, be happy, we'd be happy to do so. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, this leads me uh, kind of on. I asked you to be a little bit patient with me uh, at the very beginning, so thank you. Um, so this leads me on as to how you as a coach uh, can make a difference using the framework which has uh, now been adopted by the GA and using the principles which underpin 
uh, that framework. Uh, how can how can you make a difference uh, in your coaching behaviours and in your coaching uh, uh, expertise? And I suppose that brings me on a little bit uh, to kind of what your philosophy is. Um, uh, because that's hugely important in terms of your coaching behaviours and uh, how you actually coach. And I, I have difficulty with this one uh, myself sometimes. Uh, but before I get into your philosophy, obviously uh, most of the people listening in here are coaches. Uh, and you are central to what our young players experience at the GA. Uh, you're central to their development, uh, not just their sport and development uh, in terms of how they develop and how they actually perform, but uh, socially and holistically. So you're a hugely important person uh, in the life uh, of a young player. And as the player becomes less dependent on his parents and is getting older, the role of a coach uh, becomes more influential uh, in the life of, of, of a young person. So you have a hugely important role. And what I really want to talk about, and uh, it's an area I'm fascinated, fascinated about, is how you can make more of a difference by how you coach. Um, and as regards your coaching philosophy, uh, I'm particularly bad uh, uh, in ways in kind of deciding what my own philosophy is and maybe it changes a little bit. But I think all coaches are notoriously poor at describing their own behaviours or philosophy. Uh, and and we, we can't do it here by text, but I would love to give you a few minutes to write down your coaching philosophy because I think you would find it uh, very difficult. But maybe it's something you should do maybe when uh, the presentation uh, is over uh, is, is over later on. But do you know who might be able to tell you what your coaching philosophy is? It's probably the players you coach, because they're probably much more observant and aware of how you coach than you are yourself. I'm not saying you should ask your players uh, because maybe you might decide to uh, hand in your notice uh, depending on the type of feedback, but maybe it would be worthwhile to ask the players what to think of your coaching style because what to think, how to feel and how to behave uh, as a result of your coaching style has huge implications for their experience of the GA for their enjoyment and uh, their development. So uh, I suppose where I'm coming from uh, with all of this is that there's a huge interest uh, in the last number of years uh, in, in a player-centered uh, a, a approach to coaching. And you probably hear a lot of this yourself about being player-centered. And it obviously sounds very PC, uh, sounds very kind of uh, we're up with the with the times, but what does it actually uh, what does it actually mean uh, for your coaching? Um, and then obviously a coach centered or autocratic uh, coach um, is the other uh, end of, of of the spectrum. And I suppose if I was trying to define what a player centered coach is. Uh, in simple terms, I would say it's where the needs and the wants of the player are the primary consideration in the decision-making uh, process. Um, it's a philosophy which is underpinned, uh, I would say, by a set of values and coaching behaviours where the primary goal of the coach is to help uh, players take responsibility of their sport and behaviours uh, that create uh, result, their development uh, and, 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 and results. And I suppose the question you would ask then is, why would somebody want to be this um, uh, type of coach? And I suppose it's just from learning 
I would have done and I would believe in that sort of uh, approach. Uh, but if you look at uh, the work, uh, the coaching of John Wooden uh, in America, famous basketball coach, uh, all blacks, um, all promoting a player-centered uh, approach to coaching. Uh, not alone them, but you will get many of, of the top performing coaches all over Ireland working at the highest level and working with underage players who would advocate a player-centered approach uh, to coaching. Uh, uh, and what I would say about this type of coaching is that it creates a more enjoyable experience for, 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 for your players. Uh, it creates better development, helping you to develop the potential of your player, creates better performance results, and um, it promotes the ability of players to make uh, more informed decisions uh, in training and in matches, improves their decision-making uh, process. It helps to create respect among players, coaches, and other stakeholders. Uh, it increases the self-knowledge and self-esteem uh, of, of, of your players. Um, uh, and I suppose there's also a holistic uh, or a social side to all of this insofar as that we are coaching players and we are concerned about their development and playing in competitions, uh, but we are also giving them life skills uh, so that we're being truly holistic, we are giving them skills which they can use later on in their lives uh, and I suppose kind of what are those skills? It's the power of communication, uh, the power of collaboration, uh, the power of initiative, self-direction, self uh, flexibility, adaptability, uh, creative thinkers and problem solvers. So uh, it it's a style of coaching, which a lot of people would recommend. Um, uh, and I just want to get into it uh, a little bit um, in a little bit more detail in, in, in a few minutes. So what is the opposite of somebody um, who doesn't have a player-centered uh, uh, philosophy of, 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 of coaching? Um, it's obviously somebody uh, who is a must-win philosophy, treats the team as a whole, so it's one size fits all, doesn't cater for individual needs. Um, the most important needs, according to a coach uh, with this philosophy, is his own needs, not the needs of the players. It's more ego-driven. Uh, ego um, it means about giving out a lot of verbal instruction uh, and uh, direction uh, to the players. So you probably can see wh uh, where I'm coming from here. Uh, am I saying uh, that you can be player-centered all of the time? Uh, I'm not, and we can have a discussion about that, that later on. Uh, but I just probably need to uh, upload that photo column, if you can help me out, please. Okay, so um, this is just uh, something we got done up over, over over the last few days. Again, I'm not going to uh, ask you to uh, text in, but maybe you can reflect on it uh, a, a little bit yourselves in terms of what type of a coach uh, are, are you. So uh, first of all, we're looking um, at the autocratic uh, coach. Uh, so, have you created an environment of dependency? So, it's all about you, the coach. It's all about you giving direction. So, where I'm trying to come from here is, if, if that is uh, how you behave, what does this actually mean for the player? The player in your, rink, in your care, whom you're meant to be nurturing. The players in your care, 
have their goals set for them by you and have great difficulty in making informed decisions for themselves. That's how the player feels. Do you expect the team to conform to your way of doing things? Okay, the autocratic coach, it's my way or the highway, this is how I want you to play. What does this mean for the player? Players will ultimately compete robotically and will feel that they have a very limited input into the direction of their own development. So less motivated, more robotic, less enjoyment. Question number three, do you speak to rather than listen to your player, than listen to your players? Okay. Uh, we all know that some coaches like to speak too much uh, in the dressing room, before training, during training, uh, if we were to video the amount of times to stop training, to talk, after training, so coaches who like to talk a lot instead of listening to their players. What does this mean for the players in your care? Players can feel that they are not respected or not valued by the coach. So the coach-player relationship is affected by this sort of approach. Do you place too much emphasis on winning? So what effect uh, can this have on what your players think? This can frustrate some players and lead to a lack of motivation and interest. And I, I suppose kind of, I forget the name of uh, whoever asked the question about uh, the role of competition at an early age and was there too much emphasis on, on winning. I, I think we need to understand as coaches as well, why do kids, why do young people play games? Uh, it's for enjoyment. It's a social aspect. They want to increase their competence uh, in the skills of the games. Uh, they want to feel excitement. Uh, they want to have uh, enjoyment, uh, the love, the challenge, and some may want to win as well. But for the majority of people who play sport, it's about striving to become better and it's about striving to win. Uh, and if you don't cater for that, that in your coaching and understand why kids uh, play sports, and if your focus is totally about winning, you are not in tune with the needs of the young players uh, in, your, in your care. Number five, do you criticize mistakes and use the fear of failure when communicating with your, with your team? How does this make your players feel? This can lead to players becoming angry and, and defensive, and in some cases they can just develop a disrespectful attitude towards their teammates. So... I, I think we all know that uh, making mistakes is an essential part uh, of uh, is an essential part of the learning process. Uh, mistakes, if handled pro properly, uh, and if there's a good coach-player relationship, and through use of asking the right questions and given feedback, uh, we can improve the players. Uh, development, but we should encourage players to make mistakes because it's only by taking a chance and taking a risk will they actually learn to become better. And we cannot condone young players uh, for making mistakes. Instead, we need to encourage an atmosphere where young people are encouraged to take a chance, take risks, and make a mist and make mistakes. Um, so if we move on then to kind of what a player-centered coach is, uh, do you, and, and how this, uh, what, where I'm trying to get to here is, uh, do you understand how your coaching behavior makes your players feel? And is that important to you? And do you think it makes a difference to their development? So a player-centered coach, do you encourage your players to take responsibility for their own actions? How does this make the player feel? Players will set their own goals and will be intrinsically motivated to achieve them. So by encouraging players to be responsible for their own actions and helping them with goal setting, uh, you are 
creating intrinsic motivation, which will increase their enjoyment, much more likely to keep them in the game and will help them to perform better in training and in games. Number two, do you provide individual feedback? Do you provide individual players with feedback about their performances? What does this mean for a player? Players will feel valued and important. A mutual respect will be developed between the coach and players. Okay, how many of us actually give general? I've done it myself. We kind of talk to everybody uh, when we're given feedback, but most players won't know if that feedback applies to them or not. So we need to give individual feedback for that player to feel important, for that player to feel valued, and for that player to learn how to become better as a result of that uh, of that feedback. Uh, question number three, do you ask questions of players so as to encourage problem solving uh, and critical thinking? How does this make your players feel? Players will ultimately become more coachable since through their own learning, game understanding will improve. So asking questions is a great way to encourage problem solving and critical thinking. Do you, number five, do you value all of your players' contributions equally, but accept each player as a unique individual? This leads to a greater sense of self-efficiency and self-confidence from players, which in turn results in greater enjoyment from, play, uh, for, from playing Gaelic games. So we need to uh, have a philosophy of fairness, which is reflected in your actions by accepting each player uh, as an individual and expecting contributions from all equally, not just dealing with our favorite players, not just dealing with players who are problem players, but dealing with all of our players equally. Do you provide a confirming environment through your actions as a role model for your players? How does this make players feel? You as the coach, through role modeling, reinforce values and morals belonging to the team culture and group climate. This in turn allows players to engage freely, fully and safely within the group dynamic. So obviously increases their motivation, enjoyment, and it allows players the freedom uh, to feel uh, a sense of accomplishment uh, and feel safety within the group uh, dynamic. Uh, I'm not too sure where you rate yourselves on that. Maybe somewhere between the two extremes. Uh, we'll just move on to the next slide column. Uh, I'm just very conscious of the time as well. I'm just after seeing it. Okay, th thanks, Colum. So, uh, assuming this is the road you would want to go down in terms of being more of a player-centered style of coach, uh, what do you need to do uh, in, in order to uh, implement this type of style of coaching? Number one is you need to know the player. Uh, you need to have a knowledge of the player uh, socially so that you can develop a good uh, player-coach uh, relationship. Um, you also need to know the player uh, strengths and weaknesses, technically, tactically, psychologically, and physically, so that you're able to give the player uh, uh, essential feedback uh, and that you're able to work with the player to set out goals to improve the areas he needs to improve upon. So you need to know the player. Uh, having a games-based approach rather than running drills all of the times allows you to ask players questions, uh, allows you to uh, ask players to come up with solutions to certain strategies or tactics or whether they should move the ball faster or when to solo or when not to solo. So uh, having a games-based approach uh, allows you to ask those questions and to solve problems that you were going to come up against uh, in the game. Uh, feedback and reflection, do you, at the end of your sessions, uh, give uh, feedback uh, to uh, players? Do you, during the course of the session, get around to all of your players individually 
uh, for a quiet word and give them some feedback. Uh, and then I suppose the essential part, which kind of encompasses all of the others, is do you have a good coach-player relationship? Uh, is there a, a, a sense of trust, respect, that you are player-centered uh, and you are there to uh, essentially support that player's development and cater for their developmental needs, not just from a sports point of view, but from uh, a person uh, point of view also. Uh, obstacles, I'm just trying to run through these quickly enough now. I'm just very conscious of the time. Obstacles of uh, a player-centered uh, pathway. Um, players will be reluctant uh, possibly initially, if they haven't been exposed to a player-centered coach, they may be reluctant to engage and to answer questions. So you need to proceed slowly. You need to explain to players at the beginning of the season that this will be your approach, uh, that you want to involve the players in the decision-making process, but you need uh, to move slowly particularly where players have not uh, been exposed to this type of coaching before. They may feel a little bit uncomfortable with it. Uh, and if you're not asking the right questions, they may be baffled by uh, uh, where the question is actually, uh, where the question is coming from. Another issue with obstacles of a player centre coaching is that some coaches will feel that they are actually giving away uh, power, uh, and they will find it difficult to adopt uh, this style of, of coaching. Um, Colm, I, I, I suppose at this stage, uh, uh, I, I probably just, if, I just want to go back if, uh, just two slides. Um, that's not an exhaustive list here in terms of how to implement a player-centered uh, style of coaching. Uh, what will also be required as, as part of that uh, it is planning. Uh, because you will only have so much time with your players when you arrive for, uh, for a training session or for a coaching session, you need to have planned in advance how you are going to make your, se your, your session uh, pl player-centered. Uh, also, uh, setting goals uh, along with your players. Um, is important uh, and as part of that coach player relationship uh, how you develop communication uh, with all of your players and how you reach all of your players uh, during the training session so that list is not exhaustive uh, here are some uh, interesting uh, books which you can uh, which you can uh, will aid uh, your development as a player centered coach the Taurus booklet, uh, and I forgot to mention the likes of Dr. Anya McNamara earlier, who has done a lot of work in the area of developing the psychological uh, skills that are required for development and performance. Uh, and Anya's had a big input into that booklet, which was developed by the staff in Leinster Council. Uh, Perspectives on Athlete Centered Coaching, uh, Talent Development, A Practitioner Guide, Dave Collins and Anya McNamara and athlete-centered coaching, developing decision-makers, uh, Lynn Kid Kidman. Uh, Colm, I don't know whether I could take five minutes to actually give practical examples of this, or maybe we've run over time. So maybe uh, I'm happy to take your uh, guidance on it. Um, guys, I'd, again, I put it out. If, if everyone's happy to stay going, Michael can do another five minutes, or if we have any questions we want to ask. Um, if you're happy for Michael to go for another five minutes, just maybe give us a thumbs up. I see Gary Moore's already in with a thumbs up. Fair play, Gary. Um, <laughs> what I will say just while you're you're doing that, the Taurus booklet, I will share that um, directly with you all by PDF. So we'll get that out to you guys um, as uh, from tomorrow. We'll get the video of the recording. Um, and the other thing we will have is that, that sort of flyer that Michael showed you about the coaching styles. We'll send that on to you as well. So we'll give you a copy of that. Michael, I'm afraid you're not off the hook. I've got a good few thumbs up. So if you want to take that other oh. five minutes and okay. get through the practical examples. 
Oh, oh, okay, Colm, and I know we were talking about this uh, la last week, uh, so we need to do a little bit of work on giving more practical examples. So if we did have the emails of the people who have uh, logged in this evening, uh, it's something we will be doing over the next week or two, and we can get them out some uh, some more resources. But uh, I just give you, yeah, I'll give you just give you a few very quick examples of of, of things I have have done down the years. Is that I took over a club team uh, years ago, um, uh, maybe about twenty years ago even. Uh, but it would have sat down with all of the players individually over a three or four month uh, period. Period and what I what it cost me a lot of money buying coffee for them by the way, uh, but what I found is that it developed trust, uh, it developed respect, it gave me an insight into issues or concerns they had, and it gave me an opportunity to read and understand them. And I would believe that had a huge part in their development and success. Uh, I, I suppose with another team years ago. Uh, at the very beginning, I would have profiled all players, um, technically, tactically, psychologically, and physically. Uh, I would have got the players to rate themselves uh, in all of the different skills under those four areas. Then I would have rated them along with the coaches in the same areas uh, to get a picture of where there was a discrepancy. Uh, and I, I, I remember one particular chap, and I kind of noticed him, that he was particularly good in the air in training, maybe not so good in matches, but I noticed he rated himself very lowly in terms of high fielding uh, in the profiling. But Jeff, when I looked at him in training, I felt he was very good. Uh, I took him aside one night. I explained to him that I thought he was one of the best field, uh, high fielders I had ever seen, that I had discussed it with other people who had seen him, and they thought he was an exceptional high fielder, and I could see his self-confidence and self-esteem grow. Uh, and he went on to field uh, exceptional balls in all of our matches. It was just a confidence issue, but his own self-awareness uh, of his ability uh, was mismatched. Uh, he did not, his self-awareness uh, was not accurate, and he was putting himself down in terms of his field and ability. And a similar, another player on the same team uh, actually rated himself highly in, in terms of field and high ball, but I didn't see any evidence of it in training uh, or in uh, games. I spoke to him about it. Uh, he kind of accepted after a while reluctantly that he wasn't winning high ball in matches. Uh, so I gave him some uh, uh, homework to do at home, knocking the ball off to Gable End, uh, before training would start, I would have a few people uh, hitting high ball to him. Then I would introduce an element of competition where there was somebody trying to get up for the ball with him. And then I would have given him some leg work, jumping exercises to do to improve uh, his ability to get off the ground. And again, uh, through that goal setting, through that practice, through that feedback, through that player-centered approach, again, I've seen unbelievable results. Uh, in terms of his improvement uh, and his self-awareness became much more accurate and, and realistic. Uh, another player kind of that I would have dealt with as well uh, who was not very good at chasing back or not very good at tackling and I kept pulling him aside to explain him uh, you're not chasing back, you're not tackling uh, and eventually he was getting upset with me and he says uh, uh, Everybody's telling me I'm playing very well. Uh, I think I'm playing very well, but you're always on to me. You're always on to me about not tackling back or whatever. And I knew uh, I needed to pull back. Uh, so I put some video clips together of where he didn't chase back. Uh, after a few weeks when things cooled down, sat him down uh, and showed him the video clips. And all of a sudden, the penny dropped. Uh, and he asked me, are you going to show those clips to the rest of, the te of my teammates? He was so embarrassed that his teammates would see it and would know that he was not actually uh, making uh, the chase and runs back and, 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 and the tackle. Again, he showed a uh, huge improvement. Uh, just in terms of tonight, I told you I was with the IT Carl Harden team. Uh, we met all of those players a few weeks ago. Um, 
asked them to come back with some strategies when uh, what we would do when we had the ball, when we didn't have the ball, um, what we would do with puck outs, because we don't have time to train these fellas. They're still playing with clubs, uh, they're on county panels. So for the last six or seven years, we've punched above our weights. I noticed Tommy Gallagher is on here. He was one of those players. Uh, we've punched above our, weight, uh, above our weight by having a player-centered approach where the players have great enjoyment, great crack, but they are in charge of, of their own direction. Not entirely. Uh, at times, we have to be autocratic. Um, uh, it's necessary at times. Uh, but we empower the players to come up with uh, their own uh, solutions, their own strategies, and how they want to run the team here. And I believe that's one of the reasons why we've punched uh, a, a above our weights. Um, this is my last example. Well, I'll, I'll actually uh, give you one from Johnny Doyle in terms maybe of giving a player a cue if they suffer from getting distracted in a match or losing focus. But I remember reading an article uh, that Johnny Dial had in the papers a number of years ago uh, where he missed a very important free for Kildare uh, coming towards the end of the match. But instead of uh, getting upset and getting distracted, his cue was, what do I need now to, what do I need to do for my team now? Uh, that's what was in his head. The ball was kicked out. He picked a break up from midfield. He hand-passed the ball to somebody, took a return, kicked the ball to somebody on the full forward line, took a return pass again, and knocked it over the bar. So that's where an athlete, knowing your player in terms of uh, their psychological attributes, how you can give them certain cues that they would use uh, under uh, high-pressure situations. I had loan, loads more examples here, Colin, but I think I'll take um, I, I'll take some questions now. Perfect. We, if anyone has any questions, if they want to type them in there, um, and just while you're doing that, I come, Michael. I don't know whether that was scripted or not, but you couldn't have put it any better because uh, mentioning Johnny Dial. For those of you who aren't aware, our next <laughs> webinar actually involves is Johnny Dial delivering next nice. month on resilience. So you're you're. Um, your, your intro there wouldn't have been any better for that. So, guys, has anybody got any questions? Yeah, for I, Michael? Colin, can I just finish there? With yep. Just take me one minute. Uh, if the people are listening, if you have a pen, uh, if you're asking questions, I'm going to kind of give you some STEM um, question stems that you might use under certain situations. So, if we're, if we're taking a tactical or strategic um awareness, you're trying to develop tactical or st strategic awareness in your players, the question might be, what do you blank, blank, blank? What do you? If it's, if it's related to skill and movement execution, uh, the question might be, how do you blank, 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 or dash, dash, dash? If it's related to time, uh, the question is, when is the best time so dash, dash, dash. Uh, if it's relating to risk, the question could be which choice, dash, dash, dash. And if it comes to the rationale for a certain action, the question could be why are you? Now, as an exercise, whenever you get a chance, maybe you could fill out those blanks relating to your particular players or how you want to play the game with your particular players, depending on their needs and on the context uh, of your team. Okay, Colin, take some questions. Yeah, has anybody got any questions, guys? I'll just give it a minute if... As I said, just while we're waiting there, we will email on a video of, of the presentation tonight. Um, the Taurus book list that we have here in Leinster, we'll also send on that PDF flyer. Um, and what we might do, Michael, I'd say there was a few might not have had pens there, that sheet of that STEM question and you were talking about. I, yeah. We might send on a copy of that as well, just so guys will we'll have yeah. a copy of that. That's fine, Colin. I just see one or two are typing here, so we just give it a second. Oh, 
or even if anyone wants to put up their hand, if they're on a mic, we can open up the mics if anyone. There, Ronan has his question. Michael, any comments on the role of s and in the player pathway and how should it be integrated into youth development and at what ages? Uh, right, okay. Uh, my memory is not working too well here, uh, Ronan, at, at, at the moment, but I, I suppose where we were looking at um, uh, in terms of s and is that as part of the framework, developing fundamental movement skills uh, is, is, is an essential. Um, we would have seen, uh, in terms of the framework, we would see the focus more on the skills of the game, uh, developing good decision makers, uh, de developing the psychological attributes that are required for development and and for uh, performances. But I suppose if you're looking, uh, my own view on uh, strength and conditioning is that a lot of the conditioning work uh, can be done through through the game. Uh, in terms of the strength component, I think we're looking at sports science inputs uh, post uh, puberty. Uh, so we're looking at probably from 15, 16 up. Uh, but that needs to be done uh, in a very gradual way. So we're looking at uh, body weight exercises. We're looking at developing the movements that uh, might be required in the gym in terms of lunging, uh, squatting, uh, hip engine. Um, and we're also introducing the Gaelic 15, which is a injury prevention program. It's also a strengthening program, but introducing body weight uh, exercises, uh, strength exercises, and an element uh, of of plyometrics. So I think our focus early on, Ronan, is on developing a priority and all of the other things, but gradually introducing people uh, to uh, the strength aspect of SNC. Thanks, Pete. Michael, there's, I just see uh, one or two just typing in questions here, so if we just give it another minute. Just you mentioned there, Michael, about the GA15. I'm guessing a good few of you are probably aware of it, but I'll add that into the email as well of where the resources are and how you can access them online if anybody is interested in it, that hasn't maybe come across it before. Um, I'll just put a link. It's on the learning on the site here that you use to log in. There's material, videos, etc., accessible on that. So I'll share that with you as well for those who maybe haven't come across it before. Right. I'm not sure if we have any, or brain is just typing there. Um, it's it's got the latest as well, uh, Colin. Uh, there we go, yeah. Brian yeah. has come. Congrats on the great work carried out. Uh, what is your realistic time frame for this new pair of pathways we roll out? Uh, thanks, Brian. <laughs> well, current player of pathway cards from the Taurus be gone. Um, congrats. Uh, what is your... No, uh, right, okay, Brian, no, uh, good question. Uh, I suppose what I have learned about the GA is that uh, things do can move quite slowly, um, but I am reasonably satisfied that things will happen sooner rather than later. Uh, I, whether the terrorist uh, pathway cards, etc., will be gone, I don't know, because I, I would think what's in the terrorist, um uh, booklet uh, is also kind of recommended practice as part of uh, our recommendations and is the way forward nationally. It might get tweaked a little bit, but a lot of work has gone into uh, Taurus. Uh, it's player-centered. It's about challenging the players. Uh, it's about being uh, player-centered. It's about lots of uh, touches and individualized development. So that's kind of a lot of what I was talking about tonight. So instead of uh, instead of Taurus being uh, gone, uh, I think Taurus will be in some format as part of the player development going forward. 
and hopefully sooner rather than later. And I might just come in on that, Michael, for some that maybe haven't come across it, the tourist program has sort of been a Leinster-driven one, um, and it deals with the player pathway with age-specific. Um, now, it is age-based because of the breakdown of our competition structures, etc., but the cars themselves are, probably, are more stage-based, and those who've done the workshops, um, one of the messages we get out or try to get out as part of those workshops is you take the card as the average for the age, but if you're individualizing it, it might be using material from the card below or the card above, yeah. etc. And that's the key to, I suppose, the tourist program. Yeah, Brian, uh, Colin, but just on that, just to go back to Brian, um, I, I think the tourist initiative is is super. And I did mention at the beginning of the uh, of the presentation that there's great work going on in a lot of uh, provinces. So well, that's a Leinster Council initiative. Uh, Ulster Council also done, uh, does lots of things really well, Connacht and Munster, but they probably lack coherency. Uh, people develop good resources, but they're not shared by everybody. But again, we're all meant to be working for uh, in the interest of the player uh, and the game. So because of the structure of the GA, we tend to work in silos, um, but not coordinating uh, our efforts. Very good. Um, with that said, guys, I think we've all our questions done. I'd just like to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank each and every every one of you for signing in and registering and, and being here with us for the last, as Mike said, it's nearly, we're nearly an hour, over hour and a half at this stage. Um, I just want to, again, as I said, thank you, but in particular, guys, I would just like to thank Michael for the time and effort he's put into the presentation this evening. As you can see, I think there's been a huge amount of work. Um, to be fair to him and his committee, the work they've done over the last year has been has been Trojan. Um, the amount of consultation, etc., they've done. And as you can see, Michael is very passionate about this area, and I think that came across very well this evening. I think we're all, uh, I know I am personally, after really enjoying the, the webinar tonight. So, Michael, on behalf of everybody, just like to say thank you very much, and we wish you the best of luck with, with rolling out the, the framework. Uh, thanks very much, Colm, and I, I, I would just like to thank everybody for being so patient and um, and thank yourself, Colm, but hopefully after uh, our chat tonight, uh, all of you coaches will have some food for thought about your coaching philosophy and style and how you can more effectively maximise the development and potential of your players in sport uh, and in life. So uh, the best of luck with your coaching. Okay, with that said, guys, we'll um, say goodnight and thankfully for a change, we don't have to say safe home because everybody hopefully is at home and that's the one beauty of the webinar. So thank you very much for tuning in. And as I said, we have our next one taking place next month. I'll I'll drop an email out to you on it and it's Johnny Dial who will be taking the lead on that one. And the topic you'll be looking at is about building resilience in players. So I look forward to that one as well. And wish you all the best in your coaching journeys. And we'll hopefully, our paths will cross again very soon. So thank you very much and good night.